Hi, my name is Gerdy Verwoerd and you're listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. Linda Aspie has spent the last 30 years with individuals, groups and teams across many sectors in the areas of personal and professional development, HR, organization development, well-being and trauma. She is a qualified coach, facilitator, supervisor, psychotherapeutic counselor and as a faculty of Time to Think qualifies people to work with the thinking environment. She has launched and led the coaching division of the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, BACP. And for five years, she was the chair of the coaching panel at the UK-based Centre for Entrepreneurs, where she built a 50-strong panel of executive coaches specialising in supporting new entrepreneurs. She is an awarded fellow of the BACP. In the summer of 2018, Linda became painfully aware of the scale of the damage we humans are doing to our world. It triggered a personal journey to learn more about the science and psychology of our climate crisis and bring this to her work with organizations, leaders, teams, other coaches and the general public. Now she runs climate cafes, workshops and documentary discussions on climate psychology, writes for coaching and therapy audiences on climate change and facilitates events that bring the work that reconnects, also known as Active Hope, to wider awareness. She's currently co-editing a book called Holding the Hope on psychological and spiritual responses and practices to climate change and extreme biodiversity loss. She's hosting various webinars and workshops for some of the main professional coaching bodies to support coaches in doing useful work during these challenging times with more challenges to come. Let's dive into my conversation with Linda Espy. Linda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Heidi, for inviting me. Yeah, well, it's been a while since I invited you, and I'm glad we could finally get together. Um, I just read the introduction, and what stood out to me is that in 2018, you, I think you said you became painfully aware of the effect we humans are having on uh, the planet. Yeah. And you've been in the, the field of leadership for a long time, and, but since 2018, since you dove into Um, everything that has to do with climate and planet and the effects that we humans are having on it. Um, You have incorporated nature into that work that you're doing. What is it that made you become, as you call it, painfully aware? Um, I was working with a group of leaders on the south coast in the UK. Mm -hmm. I got into the car on a beautiful day to drive back home. And I heard the tail end of a documentary. Mm-hmm. And it was about um, species decline. And whilst I'd known about species decline and environmental problems for many years, I don't think I'd allowed the magnitude of it to really sink in. And as I don't even still to this day don't actually know what the documentary was. And it was the tail end, but there was a figure that was quoted that said that in Holland, the butterfly population had reduced by a hundred and by eighty three percent in one hundred and thirty years. Mm. I didn't know that, and I'm Dutch. <laughs> yeah, it's it's stuff we don't get to hear, isn't it? No. And I think it was the enormity of that figure. If they'd said five or ten percent, or we're used to hearing, you know, thirty years time or something, it feels distant. Yeah. Eighty three percent. I actually felt like I'd been hit. Mm. started driving along and I realized I had tears and I can feel tearful now even recalling the moment Mm. tears flooding down my face and I had to pull over to the side of the road and just sort of pull myself together and think okay I need to get home and check this and that was on a Friday afternoon Mm -hmm. so I then spent the weekend absolutely scouring the internet for more information about extinction of species um, and they hadn't said just one type of butterfly. They said all types. Mm. And so that was, for me, a transformative moment. Of yeah. Because once you know that, you can't not know it anymore. And That's you can't true. go on as normal. No. There isn't a choice for me. So what did that start for you? Well, it started a lot of learning. Um, I think for the first few weeks, I was, um, as I learned more and the horror really of how, how, 
how big the scale of the extent is of, of ecological decline and su- mm. also with that things, you know, su- human suffering, not just ecological, human suffering. Um, and I'd just become more painfully aware of everything, um, of the social injustices of the world. Um, I'd always known about them, but I kind of not let them in all at once, I think. Yeah. Mm. So for the first at least month, I, I wandered around um, in a state of shock and disbelief. Um and everywhere I looked, I saw the earth dying around me. And I don't know how much of that was actually really happening there and then. Mm-hmm. But I just noticed there didn't seem to be any insects in my garden. Yeah. Um, and I do know that, you know, insects and flies, for example, have seriously diminished. And I would notice that my car never really needed cleaning after a drive. And I, I know. It's something I was talking about last week. When I was a kid and we would go on holiday, you had to stop every couple of hours to clean the windshields and the headlights. And now I can drive from the Netherlands to Austria, which is a 10, 11 hour drive and don't have to do that anymore. It was an abundant world. Yeah. And we grew up with that as our normal. My tragedy is that generations of today see this as normal now. Yeah. Yeah. And so I spent the first couple of weeks, few weeks in grief. Um, Couldn't talk to anybody about it because it was so big. Mm. Like knowing this great big secret, and it's like sort of feeling you want to tell the world we're all going to die, we're all going to die, but you're hoping we don't. Mm. Um, and thinking, am I going mad? And am I alone here? And I spoke to a couple of friends, but people were so resistant to want to even think about it. Um, and of course, from a psychotherapeutic point of view, which is my original training, yeah. I knew what had been happening to me. I'd been in a, an advanced state of denial and distancing. Um, and hadn't really let it in mm-hmm. and naturally other people being the same and then thank goodness Extinction Rebellion launched was that around the same time that was October 2018 they launched mm. um, and I heard about it um, and thought at last at last this is somebody making a real noise I mean mm. some of the other environmental campaigners have been doing amazing work for years I, I can't uh, I can't uh, fault their their attempts but they still haven't been enough to Mm. to prevent us from getting to where we are so when xr came into being i was in there absolutely no hesitation (laughs) (laughs) and i'll be back (laughs) so how does that match um the consultancy and coaching work that you do with uh, leaders because on the surface those two worlds seem to contradict each other or, or be at odds with each other. So how, how do you manage that? Well, uh, for a long time, um, my life has been, uh, and that includes my social life, it's like I live in two different worlds. Mm-hmm. I live in the world of professional and um, social with certain people, and then I live in the world of, um, of awareness and uh, action with others mm. and it for the time for the time for the first year or two the twain did not meet because my efforts at bringing one into the other just didn't really work mm. um, and um, so I carried on doing what I do as a coach and I didn't tend to you know there's a golden rule in coaching and therapy you know you don't bring the agenda the client does that's, that's true yeah, and uh, it is interesting. That's the first question that coaches ask me when I talk to them about coaching and mm-hmm. uh, private conversations. Um, they don't ask me um, uh, questions about how is this going to happen? How is this going to impact me? Um, what should we do about it? How can we prevent the worst of this? They say, oh, but what does that mean for the coach and client? You know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Which I think is a form of intellectualization, really. It's a form mm. of you know, I don't really need to think about the problem. I'll create another one that I can distract myself with, which is yeah. how can I still be an ethical coach? It's completely understandable. Mm-hmm. The scale of it is is large. Um, so, by the way, I don't want any any uh, listeners to already think that I'm a doom merchant. No, I'm, I know you. You're not. Yeah, I wouldn't be here if I was. I, I think it's very, 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 very serious and concerning. Um, but I do have uh, a sense of an active sense of hope. Mm. So for a while I didn't blend them, and then one day I thought one of the um, one of the demands of Extinction Rebellion of the media and government is to tell the truth. Mm. 
And I thought that I wasn't actually being particularly true to that myself if I was still carrying on as normal, hiding this this not quite guilty secret because it's not a, my guilty secret, but it was certainly a secret that I couldn't share. This mm. non- It wasn't so much a secret, but it was hard to bring it into the other world. Yeah, it was. It was really mm. hard. And also, um, it was quite a relief for me as well to be away from it, because um, you know, unlike a um, uh, yeah, unlike a stressful time, you don't necessarily get through it. Mm. You assimilate something new all the time, and there's a new piece of news every time, and there's yeah. a new article every time, every day. So when I wake up in the morning, it's there, and when I go to sleep, it's there, and in the night, it's there. Mm. So I don't get away from it. So actually, to be in the other world of denial was quite a bit of a mental relief. I used to call it my mental spa. Mm. <laughs> so when I did decide to um, kind of come out on it, um, yeah. I think the first thing I did was change my LinkedIn profile. Because mm. a lot of people find me from LinkedIn. Yeah. Not so much a Facebook user for work. And I changed my LinkedIn profile. And I remember feeling quite shaky, quite vulnerable. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So I put, I'm a speaker with Extinction Rebellion. Mm. And um, a trainer of non-violent direct activism. Yeah. It was slightly thrilling as well, because I was slightly breaking the system, going against what people might have expected. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, it is a sort of coming out, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, at the same time, I recognize what you say when uh, we as coaches are like, well, you know, we're supposed to let the client bring the uh, bring the agenda and let the client meet the client where they are at at the same time i think you know i like to work with corporate people not so much the corporations themselves but people who work who work in that environment at the same time as we were talk- like we were talking about before we started this recording i present myself as somebody who walks around mountains, because that's how people will eventually get to know me. Yeah. And if they're not attracted to it, that's fine. Find somebody else. I believe strongly that we attract the people that want to work with us. Yeah. So you, when did you came out, come out, as you say? Yeah. When was that about? I think it would have been about... I guess it would have been in the spring of 2019. So that's about two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we've had COVID in the, uh, you know, in, in between, but still, so that's about two years ago. You were a pretty successful, successful in the world of coaching leaders and helping them find their purpose and, and helping organizations with all those kinds of things. And now you've come out as a speaker for Extinction Rebellion, for training nonviolent um, protest and all that kind of thing. How did that impact um, your work? A lot of people don't, didn't really notice, funny enough. So um, and I had a couple of clients contact me about some work. I do a lot of work with teams as well, mm. off-sites. I'm a bit, a bit of an off-site queen. I just love off-sites. Um, and so um, a, lot, a few people contacted me and um, I had, when we did a rebellion one time, for I was off for a week or something, and I did take five months off mm. during 20, 20, no, 2019. Mm. I took five months off in the summer to really focus on XR, yeah. get ready for the autumn rebellion. And so I decided rather provocatively to put my out of office on Thing. I'm actually out, out of the office working with Extinction Rebellion. Mm. I just sort of wanted to create awareness that someone like me, mm. um, you know, would be doing this. Um, and by the way, when I say someone like me, I, I think a lot of people make an assumption that I'm an unusual person to be an activist because I'm, uh, you know, I've got a reputation and I'm professional and all of that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But the reality is I'm a highly likely person to be an activist. Because those who are not privileged enough to be able to be an activist don't often get a look in. Mm. I would get treated differently by the authorities by being white, female, middle-aged, elderly, one mm-hmm. might say, um, and educated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and relatively well-educated than yeah. I would if I didn't speak in the way that I do, if mm-hmm. I didn't talk the way that I do, if I didn't yeah. talk to people. So I'm actually a highly likely activist. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
so um I think um so yeah so I sort of started telling people so I haven't had anyone say um I did have one organization approach me um and uh they were they were I, I felt it was I had a duty of care to let them know mm. and it was really more to do with the area in which they worked they weren't directly involved in anything that I would feel uncomfortable in working with mm-hmm. but some of their clients were so I said um I, I'd just like you to know mm. uh, that I'm an extinction rebellion speaker and supporter and activist um and um also for the longevity of the relationship because if they thought I was planning to get myself arrested um to prove a, an ethical moral point mm. then they wouldn't necessarily want to engage me for a six-month coaching program with their <laughs> team coaches locked up you know yeah so I did a couple of times just let people very gently know this is what I'm doing. If it influences your decision, I completely understand and that's, mm. that's fine. And most of them said, no, that's fine. Well, how interesting. You must tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah. You know, this, um, it is, of course, interesting. And like you say, it is, as you were talking about how you were sort of almost hit over the head with this fact that all those butterflies had, had gone extinct in the Netherlands, um something com- it sounds almost unrelated came up it's uh what do you do you know who albert speer was no albert speer was uh um the reichs architect for uh adolf hitler and minister of war and all those kinds of things and he's one of the few people who at the judgment of nuremberg got convicted but wasn't um convicted to how do you say that the punishment wasn't death he, he spent 40 years in prison yeah. and afterwards he was interviewed for a book and um he said it wasn't the, the people were asking him the wrong questions um like uh, how is it that you didn't know how is it that you it's not he, he said it's not that i didn't know it's that i didn't want to ask yeah any question the right the, the the questions because people would tell him if he said you know I, I i i need to visit the factories in the east and generals would tell him well you don't want to know what goes on there and he wouldn't ask yes. what are you talking about and that's i'm not comparing all of us to the nazis but when it comes to the extinction that is going on or to the the climate change that's going on and everything else that's happening to the planet it's easier for us to for for humanity i guess to, especially for the privileged ones which we are in the west um, to to simply sort of think oh yeah well yes that's happening and then not asking anything beyond that first question yeah. and being willing to listen to the answers yeah absolutely it's interesting isn't it that uh, it's psychologically easier yeah but actually, when you think about it on a practical level, it's not easier because we've created problems for ourselves. Yeah. We could have been addressing years ago, but because we looked away or not just us individually. I mean, I have to say that the systems that we live in yeah. that have been created for us, for convenience and by us, but have been created and marketed and all of those things. They are, they are, um, you know, they've, they've made those things possible for us. So. Um, it's natural that people turn away from things they don't feel they can influence or have impact on mm-hmm. and they can feel powerless and all of those other things. So, um, but if we had addressed this earlier, if we had been willing to face difficult truths earlier, so yeah. the kind of coaching alliance would say, mm-hmm. they talk about facing difficult truths, sorry, the kind of psychology alliance, um, then um, we would not be where we are, but you know, well, we are where we are. Yeah. So do you find this in your work that you're noticing um, a decline in nature when you're walking yeah. in the mountains? Mm, yeah, it's um, there's two things that really, well, one, of course, that really stands out is the um, the extent to which glaciers have receded. Yeah. Um, when I think back, I came here where I live now about 15 years ago for the first time. And when I look at what was then the biggest glacier in Austria, it probably still is, but it was way bigger than it is now. So over, when I go to that glacier now, it's receded an incredibly mm. length, I guess you would say. So it's a lot shorter than it used to be. And what I also noticed is that I'm finding plastics in places where I wouldn't find plastics before. 
it's um, or packaging, you know, and it's in part it's because uh, plastic bottles fall out of um, mm -hmm. uh, out of backpacks, out of pockets, out of side pockets, and that kind of thing. But also, um, it's just the way pe people treat nature. It's like I find wrappings in the strangers of strangers of places, and um, this is a bit of a nasty one, but you know, people use uh, paper. Um, tissues for all kinds of things and just drop them wherever they use them and I'm like you know carry a little bag put it in there and carry it out and throw it in a bin instead of just leaving it somewhere in nature because it sounds innocuous using uh, uh, tissues yeah. but it's treated paper it's often been uh, perfumed and and it's treated in chemical ways to make it soft so it takes forever to disintegrate and uh, and of course cigarette butts which is my my biggest thing because that's just pure poison that's been left behind. So those kinds of things, yes. And also, I think people are becoming more aware of it, but, um, you know, deforestation is not the best for mountain sites. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm flooding. It's it's funny, I lived in, a, I've, I'm Dutch, I lived in the Netherlands until I was 45 or something, and I always lived about four meters below sea level. Mm -hmm. I now live about 800 meters above sea level and my feet have been closer to getting wet living up here than they ever were in the Netherlands. Wow. And that's because um, the way they have canalized the river that runs through this valley makes it possible for the, or enables the water that comes down the mountains during heavy storms. Yeah. To cut to go through that canal with such force and speed and violence that I live on a dike and it's all it came over a couple of times. Yeah. So that's that's how you can tell, and that things are changing, and and you can also it's easy to see how much uh, rain influences the amount of meltwater that comes down because you can tell by the color of the river. So yeah, but especially the glaciers, especially. And every now and again, we have a winter like this year where the snow is staying. There was quite a bit of snow high up, mm -hmm. and it's still up there. It will take us, I think, until the end of this month, certainly and probably into July before it's all gone mm -hmm. at levels where you normally can go hiking. And the immediate thought is, oh, this is good for glaciers, but it's a little bit like. Um, people saying, well, you know, we had a really good winter with lots of snow and therefore there's no climate change. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. That's the weather. It's not the same thing as the climate. So in those, yeah, it's uh, mountains that used to be, have white summits, now uh, in general over the summer have gray summits because there's no more snow on them. Yes. It's painful to watch during our own lives, isn't it? You know, you know our own life, our own very short lifespan. Yeah. When you consider the Earth has been around for 4.5 billion years, mm. Homo sapiens around for around 300,000. Yeah, for a blink of an eye in that. In that. Yeah. yeah. And what we've done, I mean, probably in a sense since the agricultural and then, of course, the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. We take the Industrial Revolution as the sort of start of the worst of it. That's just 180 years. Yeah. And I think the last 50 have been some of our most prolific polluting years. Yep. So, um, and uh, yeah, so we, no wonder we're seeing it in our lifetime because it's we're causing it in our lifetime in a way. Yeah, yeah. And But then again, as you said somewhere in uh, earlier, we have to be willing to see it. Yes. And it's, it is true once you've seen it, once you've realized certain things, it is unable, you're unable to not know them anymore. Like the, like, a couple of years ago, I realized I don't have to clean my windshield on a drive to or from the Netherlands, which is crazy because I, I remember having to do that every, I don't know, two hours or something. You had to stop and pull over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's, I think once you get the awareness, it is a transformation in its own right. Mm. I am transformed from the person I was. Yeah. Um, my worldview changed. My priorities changed. Um, it was almost like, um, well, they do say that you don't have, uh, the psychologists say that 
personality change rarely occurs. If it does, it's as the result of a near-death experience or a religious mm. conversion. Yeah. And um, I think in a way, although uh, um, I didn't think I was going to die there and then, it brought my brought death, not necessarily my death, death of others that I love, mm. much closer to me, um, the death of people living on the other side of the world, much yeah. closer to me, people dying right now, you know, yeah. as we're being recorded. Yeah. Species dying at a rate now, as we're being as we're recording here. Um, so I think there's that moment of transformation, and and a transformation is more than a shift, isn't it? Yes, it's a complete about turn in some aspects, if not all, mm. of how you see things. Yeah, and you were obviously incredibly impacted by it because, and and it, not even realizing it immediately ju- until you felt the tears streaming down your face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's you have, you were touched somewhere deep inside. Yes. And, and, you know, a near death, I would almost call it a religious experience and I'm not a religious person, but yeah. It was, was sort of a blend of both really of a, a not a, a religious experience, not in terms of finding a particular faith, mm. um, but causing me to, um, reconnect on a different level with something greater yeah um, than myself i've always been a massive animal lover i've been vegetarian since i was 18 mm. and um vegan for the last four or five years i've lost count i think it's five actually five years mm. um and so um my, one of my first jobs was working with a vet as an animal nurse so i've always been in uh, animal dippy mm-hmm. um never particularly insect dippy um, or tree dippy but now I have become completely immersed um, if I see insects I talk to them mm. half the world would think I'm crazy I oh see- no I don't because I'm like that yeah I yeah. see a beautiful beetle and I think oh my god you're so- I found these little stink bugs mm-hmm. I've never seen them before so I posted them on Facebook and said anybody know what these are and these beautiful little things with um the pattern on the back like an Egyptian urn mm. like a, a, a painting that you might find in an archaeological dig of an Egyptian urn this little urn on the back. Um, and shield beetles, I believe, are the same. But I talk to all sorts of insects now. I just talk, tell them how beautiful they are. Yeah. Um, I thank the trees when I walk around. Thank you for the air that you've given me now. Mm-hmm. So it's been a complete conversion. Um, so I've gone all woo-woo, <laughs> really. <laughs> but, you know, hey, yeah. better, better, better get that out of the way, you know. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, those are the fun people anyways. Well, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. No, and I recognize that because I'm like, you know, when I see a snail in the middle of the, you know, the dike where there's a road going, I, I'll stop and I sort of, it takes them too long to help them cross the road. And I don't want to pick them up because when I pick them up, I always think, did I just put you on the side of the road where you just came from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you set you back a year. <laughs> But it's incredibly interesting. I just posted a uh, a video of a, a snail that sort of was scared by me and then slowly came out of his che- shell again. And just, you know, once you start looking at it, it's incredible how beautiful they are. Oh, incredible. They're the incredible little creatures. Did yeah. I tell you about the worm? No. Go oh, well, did I have a moment? Um, a, f- a few months ago, I was walking with my friend Liz, Liz Cashin, um, who lives near the Cotswolds. And we were walking through a village uh, on a very narrow lane with mm. a road by the side. And just as we were walking, this very big, fat worm was <laughs> making its way across the pavement towards the road. And I had the same dilemma of view of, oh, it's going towards the road. What should I do? You know, will it get trampled on? Or will another, another footwalker could just not see it and trample yeah. it? So uh, it happened to be a road where there was a, a brick wall on the left side, a mm. very old Cotswold stone wall. And a garden within hand's reach. So it's yeah. just, so I thought, well, I'll do what I'll do if I pick it up. And I, I don't mind picking them up. I feel quite privileged. I picked up this massive worm. It was probably 12 inches long. Yeah. and But it was thin. So it wasn't a slow worm, I think. But it was, and it was also full extended. So but I picked this thing up and it began to shrink a bit. But then I realized uh, that there was something in my, el- else my hands. And I actually thought it was poo. Mm. It was having a poo. And I just looked <laughs> and I realized the poo moved. And it was a baby worm. I, I didn't know ba- worms did gave birth. I did didn't I? know either. And I still haven't had time to look it up. But I just kept, I didn't even take a photo of it. And um, I said to Liz, 
I'm a bur- I'm a worm midwife. I'm a mer- worm midwife. This is so exciting. <laughs> so um, I th- I think it's a baby worm. Is it wiggled? Hmm. So I don't know how many more would have come out because I, d- I doubt they would just lay one at a time. So I don't know. I put her. Now I know she was a her. Mm-hmm. I put her. I can't remember what I called her. Wonder. I think Wonder the worm. So I put her up on the verge. And I hope that she didn't think, oh, just taken an hour to get down to that road. <laughs> I only wanted to go to the shop to get some yeah. tea. <laughs> but it was a wonderful moment. I felt mm. fully in tune with nature, fully yeah. in tune. Yeah. Now, someone who's listening to this, and maybe actually, they may, they may run wormeries, they may understand worms better than I, and they may mm. say I did entirely the wrong thing, or that it wasn't a worm coming out of her. She wasn't giving birth. It was a parasite leaving her body or something so who knows i'm sure i like the i like the baby story better though yeah i like being a worm midwife leave me that <laughs> leave me that <laughs> you could add it to your linkedin profile yes i could actually that would be a winner wouldn't it yeah well yeah. it would certainly get people to uh, be curious about you <laughs> yes it would hopefully yeah hopefully, yeah yeah. Mm. So have you all, well, of course, you, you know, that moment in the car driving out, driving home from uh, this, from the South Coast was a pivotal moment, but has nature always played a part in your life? Interestingly enough, not particularly, really not particularly. It's very interesting. I've not been an outdoors person. I don't like cold weather, don't like rain. Um, I've not ever taken to sports any sports at all. Anything I like doing is hit, you know, high interval, uh, high impact uh, interval training. Mm-hmm. That's the right word for it, hit. I mm-hmm. like hit and I like um, swimming, but I'm a very sporadic exerciser. I'll go through fads and phases of doing that. Um, and I'd lived in the countryside for many years. I lived in London most of my um, working life, mm-hmm. my working life, and I was brought up in a um, in a semi-rural place, um, in a town, Cheltenham, in the middle of the Cotswolds. But I mm-hmm. didn't. We didn't often go out. It was to the countryside. We knew it was there. Mm. Rather sport, really. Mm. And we had lots of greenery around us, so I was never really a rambler. Um, and then when COVID hit here, um, I started deciding I had to get out every day. Yeah. Um, and then I started some other practices, and I did various trainings. I trained to become a work that reconnects facilitator, which is based on the work of Joanna Macy mm-hmm. and Chris Johnson in Active Hope, which is a way of acknowledging what's going on in nature in our lives and finding ways to accept, feel gratitude and accept and move forward with it, with the knowledge we have. So I trained in that and that sort of took me further and further into nature. So I go out most days now when I can mm. um, and I've turned it into, sadly I've turned it into a competition against myself. So I've slightly spoiled it. Because I have to keep doing better and better on my steps. <laughs> oh, I get that. I started yeah. using the, uh, a pedometer yeah. uh, about a month and a half ago, something. Yeah. Yeah. If I now don't reach 9,000 steps a day, I, yes. you know, I'm like, I need to go out because I want to continue my streak. Yeah. You're a lightweight. I have to tell you, you're a lightweight. <laughs> uh, but I did 30,000 steps a couple of uh, days ago. So. Wow. Well done. Well mm-hmm. done. How did you feel the next day? <laughs> oh, that's, that's actually not that uh, un- uh, un- unnormal is not a word it's not that's weird for me to do that many steps because when I go hiking you yeah. easily reach that reach that number yeah yeah so 9,000 steps it is lightweight but I started doing that when I was in the Netherlands with my family and I was like I need to get outside and it was only uh, it was very urban environment yes. so I sort of had to force myself to go outside and gave myself the assignment to do an x amount of steps and to look for nature in that environment. Because yes. I'm u- so used, when I look out of the window, I see uh, right now a lush green mountainside. Yes. And when I looked out of the window there, I half of the window was taken, half of the view was taken up by an office building and the other half was a canal with barges going through it. Which is not that bad of a view, but you know, lots of houses around and lots of traffic. So, But I think what those environments do, they don't, they don't, kind of invite you do they they don't no. I mean, I've got trees outside this window now and after this talk today um, I should be going out for a walk because it's beckoning me mm. Whereas I never felt beckoned before and I guess you know the industrial zones aren't beckoning are they they're, no. they're not no. no it's why I gave myself the purposefully the assignment to look for nature to look for natural beauty yes. in that 
um, environment. And once you start looking for it, you can actually find it, but you have to very purposefully look for it because otherwise you're just passing by. Yeah, absolutely. It's there, but you know, and it's often there in small forms, you know, like in the cracks of the pavement or I saw a woodpecker on the side of a building, which is obviously not its natural habitat, but apparently that woodpecker had found some way to survive in that environment. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you you take people out, don't you? I mean, I went, when we talk, mm-hmm. you said I coached in nature. I don't coach in nature. Um and um, I'm still coaching on the same sorts of things that I wouldn't. Mm. On the whole, yeah. I've got a lot, in the last year, I've had a lot more people contacting me. Mm-hmm. Saying, I see that you're into sustainability. Um, and uh, could we talk to you about doing some coaching here? Because we're an organization that, you know, those are our values or they are actually involved themselves in addressing the climate and the ecological mm-hmm. crisis. Um, but I see you deliberately take people out into nature, which I don't do. Yeah. Yeah, that's my, you know, it doesn't happen as often as I would like, but that's always the ultimate goal. And in my coaching, even if I do it online, I send people out. Yes. I tell people to go outside. Uh, I've not yet done uh, coaching where I am walking outside and they are walking outside as well. But I've spoken to so many coaches right now that that's uh, some of them are actually doing that. And uh, it's definitely something that I'm going to try. Yeah. We both every now and again do, um, well, you do it monthly, I think, and probably with other groups as well, the thinking environment. Yeah. Um, I do that weekly with a small group. And we have decided to, this Thursday, I think, for the first time, to, to see if we can each of us go outside mm-hmm. and just find a place where we can do that without, you know, not that we're walking, but just sitting outside without our video on because, yeah. or at least not walking with video on because that's distracting yeah. but to find ourselves in a natural environment and see what that added element does when we are in the thinking environment that's interesting that's interesting i do did used to do before a lot way before covid um i did do something which was a, a, a one day retreat for one-on-one retreat with an executive mm-hmm. and they do lots of pre-work in advance mm-hmm. um, around psychometrics and stuff like that and, yeah. and surveys and a questionnaire and then they'd come and we'd they'd look at the results and analyze them. And then we'd do a, a long walk. And I used to live um, in Buckinghamshire. Yeah. So we'd walk through a lovely National Trust type grounds and everything and then go and have lunch. Mm. And a lot of the work they did was actually when they walked. Whereas, as you'll know, with the thinking environment that I teach, um, we focus on helping people to learn to give eye contact mm. so that, you know, you're getting attention. Yeah. It generates new thoughts. But equally, there is something then about connecting with nature. And that reminds me that I heard on the radio a little while ago. I'm a big radio fan. Mm -hmm. I was listening to some parents talking about their teenagers and where they had the best conversations. And a couple of the men said they had the best conversations with their sons in the car. Yeah. The the teenage sons, because they were Mm -hmm. both facing forward, you know. Yeah. They were both looking out. Yeah. So maybe there's something in that too, but I do think, yeah, going outside, it um, it changes the lens, it changes perspective. Um, you know, not much really, not much creativity really, really happens indoors, does it? No, it's there's this book that's called In Praise of Walking, um, mm. and that has it has all the science that um, that why walking is good for us, and one of the things is that it stimulates other parts of our brains especially the creative part. And the thing about nature, going into nature, especially when you go into nature for longer, Mm. there's research that that is proven, proving that when you go into nature for a longer period of time, that part of the brain that you could call your working brain, it's like um, the working partition on your uh, Mm. computer. Every now and again, you have to wipe that thing clean because there's, you know, otherwise your computer slows down or it just stops. And the same thing happens with that part of our brain. And when you are in nature for about three days, two and a half, three days, and on that third day, that part of your brain is wiped clean as well. And the combination of being outside, fresh air, in a, for me, in an kind of, in, in environment that is completely different from the office, and from that place where you are so busy and basically in a rat race continuously and moving, 
Yes. Those three things, you've got fresh air, you are in a completely different environment and you're moving, that gives you your brain space for things that it otherwise not have space for. Yeah. And that I, I was, I had to laugh when you were talking about the, these fathers who were talking to her, their, their teenage sons. It is similar to uh, walking in, walking outside, and yes. especially walking in nature. You, there is for a lot of people a discomfort in having to actually look at each other. Mm. And I'm sure you've said you, you've driven places with somebody else in the car and had the most most interesting conversations and and deep conversations as well, because there's sort of safety in that and that happens with walking as well yeah when you say that those leaders that the, in those one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions retreats did the most work while they were walking it doesn't surprise me because it there is something that happens it isn't completely understood yet yeah the how and the why of it but it definitely happens well there's also some interesting research coming out about um the the way that trees and the wildlife actually support us and send yeah. You know that there, there are certain chemicals that get released that we we attune to. Um, you know, so well we've exactly. got we've got dopamine hits from being in nature anyway. Yeah. Um, we may feel a sense of belonging in nature, mm -hmm. and I would have thought then that something going on with the trees and the wildlife is triggering oxytocin in us too, which is the bonding. Yeah. Um, you know, we're reducing cortisol stress levels um, by by breathing more deeply, by breathing differently because we're moving. Yeah, I think the combination of all of those things and the trees and the and the mycelium exuding stuff for our very benefit. Exactly, trying to do really good thinking in those environments. Yeah, exactly. And even if you know you may not go home with the greatest new idea, you will definitely go home. Yeah, healthier in many ways than you came in. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you asked me um, earlier on about a book. Mm -hmm. Um, that um, I've been reading, and I'm sure you've had this mentioned many times by your guests, and you've probably even never read it yourself, uh, which is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin. It, it has been mentioned. I haven't read it yet. Oh, it's so worthwhile reading. Mm. It's, it was written in 2013, and it's, it's having a bit of a resurgence, I think, mm. because of what's happening in the world. Yeah. There's something, in, there's something magical about the way she describes our relationship with nature, and she mm. writes from um, traditional Native American. Yeah. She's an indigenous woman, isn't she? Indigenous woman. Yeah. Um, from the Potawatomi uh, mm. tribes. Um, and she's now a professor of ecology. So she mm. teaches at a university and she writes beautifully. So she writes and she speaks. It's a lovely audio book too, actually. Really oh. nice. Mm. Um, and something that really struck me about the language of Potawatomi is there's not an awful, there are very few nouns in the language. Mm. And that made it very hard for her to learn because very few people still speak it. So she yeah. may have to make an effort to go and find elders who could still teach it. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got a great, you can feel her reverence for nature. She truly has a reverence, as does the Potawatomi mm -hmm. uh, way, way of being, is that you you don't take more than you need. Yeah. You only take what you need. You um, uh, you um, ask permission before you take, and you listen to the answer. Mm -hmm. um, you don't take the first of the crop you see, nor the last. Um, and there's some lovely ways of being that are yeah. very much, they're very positive. They're not don't do this, don't do that. They're do this, do that, because if you look after nature, nature will look after you, yep. because we're part of it. And that we're, so back to these nouns, um, there are very few nouns. And she was getting quite frustrated at how hard this language is to, to all verbs. And it's really, really hard. Mm. And then suddenly she realized the reason that there were verbs is that everything in nature has a pers has a, is a being. It's not, it's not a thing. It's a being. Yeah. So for example, you, if you see a tree, it's not a tree. It's being a tree. It's something's being a river. Mm. It's being a lake. Yeah, it's all alive, isn't it? Yeah, it's being a bug. It's yeah. being a spider. And when you see it as a being like that, then you treat it with much more reverence than you would do if you saw it as a thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I see people getting their spray killers out and their, their bug killers and their ant killers, and their, I just, I die a thousand deaths. And I think <laughs> you're just killing all these beings yeah. just because you, you can. Mm, yeah, and and also it's like when people talk about weeds, 
I yeah. always I always laugh because I'm like weeds are just flowers that we've decided grow in the wrong places. Yeah, absolutely. That's the only thing, you know, it's it's just beautiful. If you look at the intricacy of the plant itself, it's a beautiful plant. Yeah. You just happen not to want it in that particular part of your garden. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Are you a gardener yourself? I was. I don't I no longer have a garden, but I yeah, I was a gardener uh, when I still had a house with a garden. And now I don't even have I have one plant, an orchid, because I have all this nature right at my doorstep. But when I didn't have that, when I was living in an urban environment, I had a house filled with plants. Yeah. It's lovely. They they add something to a room, don't they? If you don't have that side. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. So you just mentioned the book uh, that is one of your favorites that celebrates nature. I'm using it as a cue to go on towards um, a movie that celebrates nature. There are quite a few around at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's it's controversial, um, as many environmental movies are, but I found Kissing the Ground particularly uplifting. I haven't seen it yet. Um, it was on Netflix. I don't know if it still is. And it's looking at agricultural practices mm-hmm. and how the way we've been farming has decimated the quality yes. of the soil. You know, it's now thought we've got 60 seasons of soil left mm-hmm. before we've completely eroded all of our soil away. Mm. And so how we've added fertilizer and pesticides and all of that. Yeah. Um, by the by the skilling, you know, by the up, upscaling of mass industrialization. Mm-hmm. So that was a movie that really did is lovely. It's got Woody Harrelson in as well, who you okay. might remember. Yeah, yeah, from Cheers. Cheers, yes. And I think another violent movie. I never watched violent movies, but I think he was he was yeah. a bad guy in one of the really violent sort of probably uh, yeah. urban urban movies. Mm. Fantastic actor. So it's a, that's a lovely movie to watch. Kiss the ground. Um, I think there are so there are so many that I just love, but that's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I'm going to look it up because I try to watch everything that people um, and read everything that people bring to me. I think the trouble with a lot of the movies now about nature um, is that they are having to tell a different truth than they would have told before, which probably wasn't a truth. Mm. So, um, you know, some of the documentaries we see um, were filmed in areas where the the um, the production crew were desperately trying to find stuff to film that they've been yeah. promised for example you know if they've been told that there's this rare fish that only comes once every four years to this particular place mm-hmm. then the film crew would go and wait patiently for days and days and days and then find the local and say it's not here they said oh no it hasn't actually been here for eight seasons now mm. because of climate change or yeah. because of production. so i think w- wildlife documentary makers have found it increasingly hard mm. um, and some of the stories um are far from uplifting but they do tell the truth about what we're doing to the environment yeah 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 and at the same i agree and at the same time um i know you saw the david attenborough movie um that was sort of his 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 life testament i forgot the title of it um but it starts in chernobyl and in i think it was the 80s when um that um what do you call that karen centrale what's the english word Oh, the uh, atom bomb. No, not the atom bomb, the at, uh, the, the uh, atomic uh, energy thingy. They had one of those production plants. I can't, it's so weird. I can think of the Dutch word, but I can't think of the English word. Anyways, they, they had this atomic energy. What were, they were creating energy. Nuclear, what do you call that? A nuclear reactor. Thank you. That's the... <laughs> It hardly ever happens to me, but this was so they had this nuclear reactor that had a meltdown and then this enormous um, radioactive cloud spread out over your uh, over Europe, basically, but uh, and nobody lived there for what is it now more than 30 years ago. But when you see how nature has reclaimed that place, that does give me hope. It doesn't you know, species that have gone extinct will not come back. But every now and again, um, there is a news item that a monkey or whatever animal that was thought to be extinct has been spotted again. So there is there is hope. And I I can see that here when we've had a landslide because there's been so much rain and part of the mountain has come down, 
it's amazing how quickly um, native species or species, you know, plants and everything start rehabilitating that um, those areas again. So a place like Chernobyl, where we thought, well, that's uh, that's it then. Big nuclear meltdown. Nothing is going to grow there for the next one hundred years or something. Nature is reclaiming that space, and animals are living there because there's no people living there anymore. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. and when you, did, I remember look at the movie ends with um, before it comes to the hopeful part. It uh, and there's this incredibly dark part, and I I sort of had my moment that you had when you we're listening to that story about the butterflies in the Netherlands because I was mm. I was blown away by that part and I found tears streaming down my face yeah. just looking at what we do into the planet yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. so this th this is my little bit this podcast is my little bit and my my pebble in the in the pond and creating mm. a small wave and you are doing your bit and everybody else is doing their bit and I always think when we, when enough of us throw pebbles in the pond, it's no longer a ripple. It's going to be a wave. Well, it's it's. Uh, I mean, small behavioural changes may not, won't won't get us there, but small behavioural changes create awareness, mm. and awareness means that we make different choices, bigger choices. Exactly. It means that we make pressure, put pressure on the, those those that that put the systems in place. Yeah. Because we need systemic change. We need life change. We need we need to change everything we do. We need exactly. to change the way we travel. We need to um we need to almost stop overnight as if we've got a world war on. Mm. And we need mobilization according to that yeah. um within the next three to five years. Mm. Um and that's going to be near or enough impossible to do. So um but it doesn't mean to say we can't try. Exactly. And it doesn't mean as well that there isn't something greater that we can do. Um, that keep if, if we're aware of one thing, we become aware of another. We become yeah. aware of another. Yeah, it's sort of the ripple effect. Yeah, absolutely. It's domi yeah, ripples and dominoes. Yeah. And I also think once when we create awareness, and when I am able to bring people into the mountains with me, and they start to feel that connection. Once you feel that connection, you cannot not care about something that you feel connected to yeah and you need to be able to care about this about this thing that you want because then you will want to protect it yeah and if you don't care why protect it absolutely i think probably one of the difficult the, the biggest sh shift we've had in the last few hundred years is the move towards individualism yeah is that we have our own homes we don't share them um and we have our what wealth is having more of your own space with fewer people in it, isn't it? Really, you know, you buy yourself mm. a big house and you put a gate around it to keep everybody else out. Yeah. And actually, what we need most of all in life is other people around us. We mm. need social networks and support and all of that. Um, and so perhaps there's some there's going to be need to be a shift in how we think of ourselves as individuals. And I think getting into nature is a way of remembering that we are all part of a system. Exactly. And then actually, even those that don't feel they belong, when you're in nature, you do belong. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's your home. Nature is your home. You are nature. We're, we're part of it and we belong and they belong. And um, so I think that would be a wonderful shift to see. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's almost uh, blasphemous to now ask for your final um, favorite thing. And that's the favorite piece of music that celebrates nature. That was a really hard one mm, for really, many. Yeah, I bet it is actually. And I couldn't come up with one answer. So, but like being asked to be on Desert Island Discs. Oh, I love that program. Yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? So, can you cut? <laughs> can you cut for a moment. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't have the time to really think about it. I'd like it to be something that I really mean. Uh, rather than just pluck out of the well, air. Well, you know, some people say, I, I really don't have one. Because yeah. it is a hard one. Yeah. Oh, I've got it immediately. I've got oh, it. There you go. So my favourite thing that tunes me into nature, really, is Kate Bush singing Sunset. Mm. On the album Ariel. And she says, it could be honey in a sea of honey, in a sky of honey. Um. And she described, and, and it's just wonderful. In fact, the whole album, she's got, 
she's got doves cooing on it in one of the songs. Mm. It's absolutely magical. And you feel that she's really in tune with, with nature. So, yeah, it would be Sunset. Um, mm. By Kate Bush. Sunset. Yeah, Kate Bush. Yeah. And she's got this ethereal voice. Yes. It's, she's amazing. Oh, I'm totally, totally lovely. And she shares my birthday. Oh, there you and, go. Yeah, there you go. You see, we were so that was that's really rather wonderful to know. And um, that I share a birthday with someone just like Kate Bush. It's quite incredible, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. OK, final question. And that is, is there one thing that you can give the listeners like a tip or something that will help them um, connect with nature? Yeah. And or step into their self-leadership more than they are already doing. I think it would be to think about their life through their head, their hands and their heart. Mm. Because people can often intellectualize stuff and just read about it or watch a documentary and then switch off and think it doesn't really matter. Or they read about it um, as, uh, or, 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 or see it, and they go straight into some kind of action. Mm. And I think that w- what we need in this world is a really greater connection to ourselves to think about what, how do I feel about this, what's going on in my heart, never mind what my head says, never mind what I want to do. So I think finding time and space to really understand how we feel, why we matter, why nature matters, then we can make much better solution, make much, much better decisions about how we live the rest of our lives. So I just, that would be it. Think head, hands, heart. Um, don't miss out the heart. I like that. On that note, Linda, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've loved talking with you. Good. You've been listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other one on the podcast page on the Dare Greatly Coaching website. The podcast is available wherever you like to listen and it's hosted by me, Gerdy Verwoerd. The music is Butt Bursting by Poddington Bear. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. And in the meantime, as always, go Dare Greatly.